boldly going where no science show has gone before. The Naked Scientists. Hello, and welcome to this week's Naked Scientists with Helen Scales. Hello, Helen. Hello. And also with me, Chris Smith. Coming up, a complete genome, but at a fraction of the price that it used to cost. Scientists have unveiled a much faster, and much cheaper way to decode DNA, and we'll tell you how it works shortly. Also, why you should savour every single mouthful. New research shows that eating too fast makes you feel less full up, and you're more likely to overdo it. And how babies cry with accents. Yep, scientists have shown that newborns mimic the way their mothers sound. And we'll be talking to one of the researchers who's made that discovery and find out why the babies do that in just a minute. Helen. Thanks, Chris. And on the subject of babies, this week we're exploring the science of reproduction and fertility. We'll hear how body temperature can be used to track a woman's ovulation and a new invention that uses temperature to tell you when you're most fertile. We'll also be finding out why some people have difficulty conceiving and the sorts of techniques that can be used to help them, including IVF. And not to leave out the fertility theme, Diana's also looking into an answer to this question. Hi, it's Harvin Tupol from Milford Haven here. My question this week is, how many children does the average sperm donor create? And you can hear just how many, and the answer will surprise you, in this week's Question of the Week. That's on the way. In the meantime, if you'd like to get in touch with us, email for the show chris at thenakedscientist.com. The Naked Scientist podcast, powered by UK Fast, the UK's best hosting provider. On the web at ukfast.net. Now, Chris, did your mother ever tell you not to eat your food too quickly? Well, frequently, but uh, <laughs> and if she did. But her and cooking my... was so bad that she didn't need to give me that advice. Oh, I'm just joking. That's not very nice. She's anyway, um, well, if she did, it turns out that isn't just an old wives' tale. But actually, she, your mother, probably was actually onto something. Scientists have discovered that when people eat slowly, more appetite-suppressing hormones are released, and that means you're um, actually less likely to want to keep on eating than if you scoff your food really quickly. Now, this study came from a team from Imperial College in London and the Athens University Medical School in Greece and they published the study in the Journal of Clinical Endocrinology and Metabolism and what they did was um, was they cr- they recruited a group of volunteers and they were asked to not eat anything for 10 hours before they came into the laboratory and they were given um, 300 millilitres of ice cream to eat. It doesn't say what flavour, <laughs> but uh, it was about 670 calories worth of ice cream. That's a big portion. It's a big bowlful. I think it's, yeah, it's a good bowlful of ice cream. And on two separate occasions, um, these volunteers were asked to eat the ice cream either um, in five minutes. I think it, it, was, it was divided into two lumps and you were allowed to eat one lump in, in a minute and then wait four minutes and eat the second lump um or you were also asked they were also asked to nibble it slowly over half an hour and um, just stop it melting <laughs> i think what they did was they divided the ice cream into seven portions right and presumably kept the ones you weren't eating in the freezer. And every five minutes they were given one of these portions and asked to eat it within a minute so that they were eating it at a regular pace during that whole So in other words, hour. you've got the sort of binge <clears throat> version versus the more sustained, slow, make-it-last-longer approach to exactly, eating. Exactly, exactly. So, so Homer um, Simpson versus the more sedate <laughs> manner more, of eating. The more refined at dining, exactly. Um, and what they did was, before the experiment began, and then um, during it and for up to three hours afterwards, um, levels of blood hormones were measured in the in the volunteers. And these uh, were hormones including something called uh, ghrelin, PYY, and a glucagon-like peptide, or P- uh, GLP-1. And uh, these are all things that are produced in the gastrointestinal tract um, in response to food being eaten. And they all act on part of the brain called the hypothalamus and they were all known to play an important role in mediating how hungry we feel and how full we feel. So a really important part of how much energy we take on, you know, how hungry do you feel, how much food do you think you want to be eating? And uh, the volunteers were also asked to um, reply to standardised questions about how full or hungry they felt at different points throughout the study. And what they found was that um, two of those hormones, PYY and GLP-1, were both in much higher concentrations in the volunteers who ate slowly compared to the fast eaters. And um, and they also the the slow eaters uh, also felt much full. Um much more full after they'd eaten their ice cream nice and slowly. So really it seems that when you eat more slowly, your guts are actually better at telling your brain 
that it's time to stop eating, that you've had you've had a good meal, you know, that's enough, um, you can stop now. And actually other past studies have suggested a link between fast eating and um, body weight in adults and children. And this study is now really the first evidence of, of a real physiological link between those two phenomena. So um, really, it perhaps it pays to listen to your mother and uh, we could all perhaps benefit from enjoying our food rather than morphing it right down. I suppose that also explains why uh, there's such a problem with things like sugary drinks because what they do is to put enormous amounts of energy into you very, very quickly before you've had a chance to then realise how many calories you've taken on board. And this means you're more likely to overindulge from a calorie point of view because your brain doesn't get the signal to stop taking in the energy until obviously a lot lot has gone in. Yes, I think obviously this is the beginning of really understanding what's going on and it's just one type of food and we can imagine that there's lots more studies to be done, different types of food, you know, different combinations of bulk and so on. But uh, but it's certainly an interesting idea of, of, of what makes us want to keep on eating and what says, you know, I've had enough ice cream now, I'll put the rest back in the freezer. Well, some people say that uh, body mass index how much you weigh, is in your genes. And in order to find out answers to questions like that, we need to be able to sequence everyone's genetic code. Now, that was the promise of something called pharmacogenomics, the idea of tailoring the treatment you receive, predicting the diseases you're going to get on the basis of what's written into your DNA. The big problem with this is that the Human Genome Project, to sequence about one person, cost $100 million dollars. And it took many years. So the race has been on for a long time since to try to find very cost-effective, very fast and very accurate ways to sequence very big genomes, like the human genome, all three billion DNA letters of it, very quickly. And there's a paper in Science this week which could offer some prospect of that becoming reality. It's a company in California. I spoke to them earlier this week. They're called Complete Genomics. And they have a new technique which has enabled them at a price tag of just $2,000 and two weeks to sequence three people's genomes. So it takes about two weeks and $2,000 per genome. But they've done it for three people and they get very, very high accuracy. The technique's very complicated, but... I can attempt to explain how it works because it's incredibly elegant. What they do is they take the genome, so the entire genetic code of a person, they chop it up into little chunks, each about 400 DNA letters along, and then they insert between each of those little chunks special sections, which are adapters, as they're known. These are pieces of DNA with a very specific sequence, and they link these back together into small circles. So they've basically broken up the genetic code into lots of little circles into which are inserted these special adapter sequences. They then take that solution of DNA and dot it onto a special chip. This is about the size of a microscope slide, and they can get one billion dots of DNA onto this using a very accurate precision-made tool that puts the dots down. And the DNA, before they do that, is made into what they call DNA nanoballs. So they basically copy the circles with a special enzyme called Phi29 many times. It just goes round and round and round the circle, making lots of single-stranded DNA. These stick onto the slide, and then they use a very clever laser-driven technique to sequence the DNA. So what they'll do is they, first of all, add... um, some probes and these probes first of all bind onto the adapter sequence so they register they line up the adapter and they lock on and then in the probe there is a special dna base that recognizes whatever genetic letters are next door to the probe and they flash a certain color and they can do this enough times and read it off with a laser because they're processing a billion samples at once on the slide they can get through lots and lots of dna quickly and all the time they've got a computer working out what the genetic sequence is and by lining up all the different genetic sequences they can begin to see which bits overlap with what and piece back together a whole genome. So it's really the whole genome that they're sequencing? Yes. That's extraordinary and this has so many applications if you're really talking about quickly and cheaply doing a whole genome of not just people but you know, anything Well else. I phoned up um, Dennis Ballinger who is the, one of the vice presidents of the company and I said how would this compare with other competitors, because there are other ways to sequence the genome on the market. Mm. There are other, other people doing similar things. And he came up with uh, probably what he thought was the most likely competitor and said that their figures stated earlier in the year were to do the same job 
to sequence the whole genome, but it cost them $40,000 and it took them two months to do it. So they're basically doing it in a quarter of the time of the competition and at about 20, a twentieth of the cost. It's amazing, absolutely amazing. Well, how could I resist this week? Um, a really brilliant shark story that hit the science news headlines. And it was a study by American researchers who have been tracking nearly 200 great white sharks over the last decade as they swim around the Pacific Ocean. Now, this was published by the Royal Society in this, their Series B journal. And the study was a big team of researchers led by Salvador Jorgensen from Stanford University in the US. And they revealed some important secrets about these amazing beasts, including pinpointing their favourite mid-ocean hangout, a spot of sea in between Hawaii and the Californian coast, and they've nicknamed this the Shark Cafe. And they really have. That's in their paper. It's not just the news people calling it that. That's what they put in their papers, Shark Cafe. And uh, the team basically went about uh, using a combination of satellite tagging technology. They went out and tagged a whole load of great whites with these um, very cutting-edge satellite tags. They also used acoustic tags, which um, are actually sensed by detectors that are placed around different areas, a lot of them along the Californian coast and also across the rest of the Pacific. And then also DNA analysis samples, um, DNA samples were taken from wild sharks. And what Jurgensen and the team discovered was that every winter, sharks in this population in the northeast Pacific regularly migrate away from the coastal waters of California and they swim for over 4,000 kilometres to the warm waters of Hawaii. And then in the summer, following summer, they go all the way back again. Why? I mean, it's, it's a, a very, very long way for them to go, it's isn't it? It's a very long way Use to go. Use a lot of energy, so exactly. there must be some benefit, but why do they do that? Exactly. Well, we'd all love to spend our winters in Hawaii, I'm sure, but uh, why do the sharks do it? And the answer, unfortunately, is we don't really know, but the researchers think that the sharks are probably going to Hawaii to eat, and the sh that some of the tags were showing them that the sharks were regularly diving down very deep, which is probably showing that they were actually hunting for prey. And as for this mid-ocean shark cafe well what was going on there well it seems that they were probably feeding there as well but probably mating and that was what it um, was shown by the fact that lots of the males and females were mingling at this shark um, cafe and at about the right time that could um, be for the females to get pregnant before they go and give birth um, in nursery grounds um, further east because you know great white sharks gestate for 12 months or maybe as much as 18 months it's an extraordinary long time that these um, sharks are pregnant and they for. give live birth and they give live birth it's amazing um, and uh, they've also shown, um, this study also showed that some of these sharks keep coming back to the exact same bits of coastal habitat off um, the American coast. And we think it's probably because they can hunt more successfully in areas of sea that they know very well when they get to know them. That's good. And what they've also shown um, is that this is, a, this is a separate population. These northeast Pacific sharks don't mingle with the Australian sharks or with the South African sharks. And that's really important information for conservationists because even though lots of us, well, lots of people are still scared at the idea of these big, huge predators. They are sadly facing quite an uncertain future because of overfishing and their fins are very valuable in the trade for shark's fin soup. So really what this study is doing is picking out some of these really vital details about their lives and highlighting that they aren't simply mindless killing machines that mill around aimlessly, but these are animals that undergo complex migrations and we're only just really beginning to understand them. And uh, scratch the surface. It's amazing how much is hidden from view beneath the surface of the sea. Thank you, Helen. Now, also this week, uh, scientists at the University of Würzburg in Germany have teamed up with their colleagues in Leipzig and also in Paris, and they found that the cries that young and newborn babies emit actually mirror their mother's accents. And to tell us how they've discovered that, we're joined now by Kathleen Wurmke, who's the head of the Centre for Pre-Speech Development and Development Disorders, and she's at the University Hospital of Würzburg. Hello, Kathleen. Hello. Welcome to The Naked Scientist. Thank you. Um, What's this study actually show? The study actually show an extremely early impact of of the surrounding mate of the surrounding language of native language a fetus was exposed to in the womb, and this is of course new because we 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 knew since many researchers investigated that during the last years that their that infants are sensitive to prosodic features of the native language long before they are born and that they memorize those patterns as a newborn, but it, is, it was not known that they are capable so early also not only to memorize, but also to reproduce those patterns in their own cries. How did you do the study? We recorded the cries of the newborns in Paris and in Berlin and Germany, and then we um, came back to our lab laboratory, acoustic lab, and we analyzed the frequency spectrograms and the melody contours of the cries, normalized type 
fry time because not each fry has the same duration. And then we looked for at what time point the pitch maximum, the melody maximum was reached for that more at the beginning or more at the end of a cry. And so we could compare between the groups of German and French infants according to their melody contour, having either a rising or a falling contour. Shall we have a listen to some of them? Okay. Well, you sent us some of the recordings you made, so first of all, I'll play the rising cry. Okay. <coughs> play that again. <coughs> and, and here's a falling cry. So that's basically one that goes down at the end rather than going up as it goes along. How does that mirror the native language spoken by the mothers of those babies? Uh, it mirrors it because French intonation is, uh, intonation is characterized by a pitch rise toward the end of several kinds of prosodic units, uh, to words or phrases, whereas uh, German uh, typically exhibit a falling melody contour. And, and so why do you think that the babies when they've got a lot going on in their lives when they're newborns, why should they prioritise being able to mimic mum in this way? Why does this give them benefit? Uh, we think that this, this uh, observed behaviour is just simply a reflection of the special aptitude human infants have to acquire language. They are hardwired to acquire language, and we, are, we know that they have a special sensitivity for melodies and rhythms already being a fetus and then also being born. So we think this is just showing how early language development starts in human infants based on their on their brain mechanisms and genetic programs to really to acquire language. Is this language that they're acquiring in utero? So while they're inside mum and towards the end of pregnancy, they're listening to the sounds and vibrations from her voice being transmitted to them while they're inside, and that's where they learn to mimic before they've even been born? Yeah, that's what we what we guess, because they, they are able to listen for three months at least, um, being in a womb, and they had only one or two days after delivery. But, of course, we are not sure. Maybe this one or two days after delivery were enough to learn the specific intonation patterns of their surrounding language. We are not sure, but we guess that most important are the three months inter- uh, prenatally. And in animals? Um, in animals, it is known that, that that it is well known that they have already a lot of uh, prenatal auditive learning, but I'm uh, not sure if anybody uh, checked already the 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 postnatal the very very early postnatal um, impact of those prenatal learning processes. But uh, I sure I'm sure it should be observable in in animals too. And one of the things you say in your paper is that if a baby sounds like mum, she's more likely to bond with it. Um, that seems reasonable. Uh, probably, yeah. We, we have no... Of course, we don't know, but according to the theoretical uh, implication that study and other studies have, uh, it might be that this really fosters bonding between the, the newborn and the mother, but it seems to be rather unintentional because, because being just a reflection of the... Of the uh, capabilities the human infant um, has from his uh, from his uh, genetic programs and behavioural uh, mechanisms. Thank you very much. We'll leave it there. Thank you very much, Kathleen. That was Kathleen Wurmke, who's at the University of Würzburg. She was explaining how babies perceive the general tone of their native language and mimic it even before they're born. Keeping you abreast of the world's best science, The Naked Scientists. You're listening to The Naked Scientist with Chris Smith and me, Helen Scales. And sticking with the subject of babies, we're taking a look at the science of fertility this week. On the way, we'll find out how a new temperature monitor conceived in Cambridge can help women to tell when they're ovulating. And we'll take a look at some of the causes of infertility as well and what science and medicine can can now do to help us with the problem. And if you'd like to contact us through Twitter, it's at Naked Scientists or you can send us an email to chris at thenakedscientist.com. Thank you, Helen. Now, most people... People have probably heard the claim that body temperature changes when women ovulate. But can this actually be used as an effective fertility aid? Well, there are a couple of scientists here in Cambridge. They're doctors Oriane Chauziot and Seamus Hashir. And they're from a relatively new Cambridge-based startup company. It's called Cambridge Temperature Concepts. And they say that temperature can be used to do that. And they've come up with a new way to measure it. Welcome to both of you. Good to have you with us. Thank you. Hello. Um, so, Oriane, let's talk to you first. If you could just tell us what's the situation with temperature and the menstrual cycle, how does it change? 
So early in the cycle, a woman's temperature would be quite low, um, but just after ovulation, uh, her body will release a hormone that's called progesterone, and that hormone has an effect on body temperature. It makes it rise, and that's the that rise of temperature that we are detecting with our fertility monitor. Why do you think that the temperature changes in this way anyway? What's the benefit of that actually happening? Why should these hormones have those effects? Do we know? Well, they have an effect on the blood vessels um, that are located near the skin, and that is the reason why temperature changes. Now, I don't know if there's a a benefit to it or not, um, but that's the situation. Is that why um, when women are pregnant, they tend to get a glow? They get this sort of cloasma is the name, isn't it? And and they tend to get a sort of glowing face, and also the the neck tends to be more red. And I've I've heard that this is because of enhanced blood flow. Mm -hmm. That's quite possible indeed. (laughs) So when you say temperature is low or temperature is high, how high and how low are we talking? Um, the difference between low and high can be as little as 0.3 of a degree. And can What's be a, degree C? Yeah, degree C. And can be as high as 1.5, depending on the woman. And so uh, just talk us through the menstrual cycle then and what's happening at various points and how you would go about using that to predict, uh, on the basis of temperature, what stage of a cycle a woman's at. So if we take a textbook cycle, which is 28 days, obviously isn't the case for most people, but let's stick with that for now. Um, The first 14 days is when the temperature is low and that's when the body is um, getting some um, follicles ready uh, for ovulation. This is in the uh, ovaries ovaries where you're maturing future eggs. Yes, that's the case. Um, And then one of the egg one of the follicles will be ready to release an egg, and that's the time of ovulation. Just after ovulation occurs, um, the body will start secreting progesterone for the following 14 days, and that will allow the body to get ready for um, potentially a fertilized egg to implant, and that would be the start of a pregnancy. Now, if pregnancy doesn't occur, um, temperature will go low again because progesterone will drop at the time of the period. And so your proposal is that if you measure body temperature very accurately, you could potentially predict when that ovulation is. Why is it helpful to know that? Um, So the highest chance to get pregnant for a couple are the days around ovulation. Um, Most couples don't know when that happens, and so allowing them to have that information increases their chance of conception by about three times. So that's why we found that it was very useful to, to provide them with that information. Now, you've used what you called a, a very artificial menstrual cycle, 28 days. You said most people aren't. I mean, most women are a little bit longer than that, aren't they? But um, what about many women who have irregular periods? Mm-hmm. Does, does the temperature situation work there? It would. Um, you have some uh, information that you can use, some patterns that are specific that happens just before relation. You sometimes have a little dip of temperature just beforehand. Um, but it's uh, quite specific woman to woman. So um, the monitor that we've designed the dual fertility monitor will actually learn from the temperature patterns from a specific woman and use that cycle after cycle to help her find out when she's most fertile. So basically what you're doing is you're building up a profile of that person's temperature and how it probably relates to their fertile window That's so correct. that with by, by the machine learning you learn from experience and you can then begin to give information to that person about when it's probably a good time. That's completely correct. Um, the other advantage we have is the device connects to the internet. Um, so the data of one cycle can be compared to the one of all the other users that are using the product, which increase the accuracy by a lot. Wow. So you can actually sum data from a very big population of users to yes. extract trends. So, so actually this is not just a, a sort of personal tool for the users. It's actually a research tool as well in that respect. Yeah, completely. So the company is learning. We are. H- how many people are, are taking part? Seems like a good time to ask Seamus. <laughs> is you actually the guy who you've, you did a lot of the engineering on this? Um, yeah, I'm uh, the inventor of the, the little sensor that uh, collects all the data. Um, to answer your question, we did a um, trial throughout the EU of uh, about 100 couples um, between December and May of this year. Um, that gave us our sort of initial database of uh, ovulation cycles to look at. Um, and there's uh, several hundred units in the field right now collecting data and uh, calling back home and uh, depositing that data with us. (laughs) What do Um, people say? How do people react to the fact that you're basically logging their menstrual cycles? I mean, mean, obviously, it's it's an interesting thing, and and they can probably see the benefit for others, but do people feel a bit tetchy about the the fact that their own personal body (laughs) rhythms are being beamed off over the Internet to your company? Um, 
To be honest, we haven't had a single person um, be concerned about it because one of the key benefits is that that data can be flagged up if there's anything unusual going on uh, and our in-house fertility experts can look at that data and then come back to them with a a question, say, were you ill last Tuesday? Um, Or if not, then, uh, you know, um, this has affected your cycle in this way. Um, Perhaps you could talk to your doctor about uh, this or that feature. That's interesting. So if they get swine flu, which many people probably are, you're probably going to record <laughs> that as well, aren't you? Um, well, we, we haven't uh, built algorithms to detect swine flu due to a uh, dearth of data in our database <laughs> for swine flu, but uh, in the event that uh, we have thousands of people call in saying that that's what they got, then uh, in theory we could uh, develop ourselves a f- but, swine but if, flu detector on the back of it. But if someone does have a feverish, a, fever, a fever-related illness, anything that causes their temperature to go up, that presumably is going to mask an effect that you would be able to see that month, isn't it? It changes the temperature, but it changes it in a very different way than ovulation does. Um, When you get a fever, um, the change tends to be very rapid and very much greater than the um, change due to menstruation. Uh, And, of course, it doesn't happen around the same time as any of the other indicators that we're looking for, um, uh, suggesting that ovulation might, unless you're incredibly unlucky and you get a fever on the day of ovulation. Um, So it's usually very easy to spot uh, the difference between uh, sort of some other source of temperature change. So there's basically a thermal fingerprint or a thermal profile that goes with ovulation and you can dissect that out of the other background thermal data that you're recovering so you can still be relatively accurate no matter what. That is essentially the heart of the algorithms that we run, yeah. Now look, I, I've, this is the first time today I've seen your unit and I have to say this is amazing. I'll just describe this for the people at home. Um, if you imagine a mouse that you'd operate your computer with it's about palm size, and there's two colours, pink and blue. I presume that they don't actually uh, discriminate between the sexes. <laughs> well, um, we've, we've uh, actually found that people um, seem to prefer, actually, the, the non, <laughs> non-gender-specific colours of uh, white, lavender and green. <laughs> but the, the, this is accompanied by a tiny thing which uh, it, it's a, looks like a bit like a miniature bath plug, but it would be about a, a half the size of a bath plug. What actually is this? Uh, so that uh, it's about 25 millimetres wide and 5 millimetres thick. It's the sensor itself. Um, now, that's worn under the arm um, and uh, worn with uh, an adhesive uh, to keep it there continuously. What that device does is it measures temperature very, very precisely. It's actually got two temperature sensors inside um, across a um, known thermal barrier. What that allows us to do is measure not only temperature but heat flow. So if you're under the blankets in bed... Um, and it's worn on your skin surface, that will be uh, a different heat flow than if the blankets weren't there. The amount of heat leaving your body would be different. That allows us to measure the core temperature very well while you're sleeping. It also contains a movement detector so that we can tell when you're sleeping um, compared to when you're awake. Because what because you really the, want... presumably the accuracy and the precision of measurement during sleep is much less variable and therefore... Well, the, the, the temperature is less variable, therefore your measurements are more accurate. And the physiological thing that you're trying to measure is the deep sleep temperature. Uh, so what we're doing is automatically detecting when you're asleep, when your body's uh, in a sort of good thermal environment and then making corrections for all of the external changes that could be going on so that we can get a good handle on what's going on internally. And how does the tiny sensor tell the mouse size base station, which is presumably the thing that then collects all the data? Yeah. How do so the two talk to each other? What you've got is um, the device has a single button uh, and a little track wheel, sort of like a lot of consumer electronics devices and iPods and things have today. Um, what you do is you uh, simply turn the device on by holding down your middle button, um, hold that down, and it will uh, then start looking for the sensor. You bring it close to the device, uh, and it reads out um, so it's a radio link the data. It's the a two. wireless radio link, um, and so it doesn't emit any radio while it's being worn. Um, the radio link's actually from the little handheld reader to the sensor. Um, what that does is it downloads all of that data and performs uh, statistical analysis on it in the background. So how do I then see that data? Um, so after it's finished reading out, it will uh, give you a display indicating your fertile days uh, for the prediction in advance. So it has uh, one indicator that says that uh, what today's level is, and the brightness of um, each day segment tells you how likely you are to conceive. Now, that takes into account um, both the male factors for the couple, which may change the likelihood of conception before ovulation, and female factors, um, which may change the likelihood of conception after ovulation. And how does the data get to you? 
Because obviously this is not a computer, this is a handheld device. So how does, how does it connect to the internet to tell you about the temperature profile? Yeah, so on the side of the device you'll spot a small USB connection, uh, like you have oh, yes. for cameras yeah. and things like that. You plug that into your PC... Uh, and then it looks to the world like a flash disk, uh, like one of those little um, USB thumb drives. That contains some PC software that you can run, which will show you uh, a historical display of all of your data um, and your future prediction for up to six days in advance, um, which is what the monitor displays as well. Most importantly, it will then connect to our servers over the web, transfer that data, uh, and allow us to um, perform a correlation between your data and, as we say, all of the other women using the system. So we find those women with similar cycle patterns to yours. Um, if you have a very stable cycle, there'll be a group of women there that share very stable, similar cycles to you. If you have a condition like, say, polycystic ovarian syndrome, which is about one-third of uh, women who have um, infertility uh, difficulties or very irregular cycles, it'll find other women with similar hormonal responses to ovulation, so the size of that temperature change um, and cycle length variability. And it'll bundle up those people that are similar to you and use that information to uh, improve the predictions on the reader for you you in particular. Thank you, Seamus. And just quickly, Oriane, um, this has obviously been on the market now for a little while. What does the data look like? Is it successful? Is it working? The data is quite successful so far. Um, early on, especially during the trial, we had a couple with great um, problem fertility problems and we have been able to help quite a few of them to um, increase their understanding of their cycle and a few of them managed to get pregnant as well in a short period of time so we were very pleased with that. Thank you very much to both of you. They're with us if you'd like to ask them any questions. The email address for us, chris at the Naked Scientists and we are of course also on Twitter at Naked Scientists if you'd like to join in on Twitter. Lifting the lab coat on the world's best science. The Naked Scientists. Now, we've just heard how you can monitor your body temperature to find out when the best time is to conceive. But some people need a bit more help. And that's where treatments like in vitro fertilisation, or IVF, come in. Now, to explain a bit more about the process and why some people need it, we're joined now by Julian Norman Taylor. You know, he's a consultant gynaecologist at the Chelsea and Westminster Hospital in London, and he also runs IVF Chelsea. Hello, Julian. Good evening. Hi, thanks for joining us on The Naked Scientist. Now, to start us off, could you perhaps describe to us what happens when someone's referred to see you because they're having problems with their infertility? How, how do you approach that case and, and start to work out what the problems are? Well, we take a full history from them, and there's a couple of things we want to check out first before we get to the fertility aspects. Um, that would be their general health. Uh, are they diabetic or uh, have any other... Uh, problem? Um, are they generally fit and ready for pregnancy? Um, importantly, have they been immunized to rubella and are they taking their folic acid vitamins? But beyond that, we start taking a history uh, directly related to fertility. So the obvious thing is, um, are they in a relationship uh, where uh, fertility is possible? It's not all that unusual for people to come and see me um, who actually don't live in the same country, uh, which obviously presents problems. But beyond that, um, we're looking really to see if the lady uh, is making some eggs, whether the chap has some sperm, and whether the anatomy uh, is in uh, correct functioning order. And so to do that, um, we take a full history from the woman. And the most important thing really would be her age and the regularity of her menstrual cycle. So a woman with a regular menstrual cycle is generally ovulating okay. And quite often they've done little tests, such as the one uh, from your previous contributor, where they measure their temperature or check their urine for hormones to see if they are indeed ovulating. So, so the problems often will come down to um, a lack of eggs or, or a, something going wrong with the sperm. I suppose it has to be one or two of those things, does it? Or the third, where the anatomy uh, for the female is incorrect. That's right. And, and what are we looking at as the common causes for some of these problems? What sort of things do you see um, going wrong? Well, it divides up roughly equal to about a quarter of the patients have some sort of ovulation problem, a quarter have some sort of male factor, others there's an anatomical problem, and then another significant proportion... Um, you never actually get to find out what the problem is, and that's a group called unexplained infertility. So there's still quite a big question mark hovering over some people who just aren't able to conceive? Yes, um, clearly there is a problem, but as I say to the patients, it's not 
that the problem isn't doesn't exist. It's just we're scientists and doctors can't work it out yet. We haven't yet got the answer to that one. And how many people, in general, does this tend to affect um, this problem of general infertility? Well, the oft-quoted figure is one in seven couples will consult a doctor, though not quite that many would actually require treatment. But it's a remarkably common thing, uh, and uh, numerous people will know people who've uh, had treatment. Yes, and we all we all hear about um, IVF, in vitro fertilisation, as, as one of the possibilities we have for, for treating infertility. What's, what's going on with that? What, what happens when, when a couple goes to have that treatment? Well, that uh, is a very common treatment, and it's usually when um, the fallopian tubes have been damaged, most commonly by chlamydia or something called endometriosis, uh, and the other common reason is when the male fa- there's a male factor, the sperm just aren't so strong. And what we do there is uh, the hormone that drives the ovaries is called FSH, or follicle-stimulating hormone. And when the period begins, we give the patient or give the woman some extra FSH. And so, so instead of just the one egg that they would normally grow, over a period of 11 days or so, uh, they end up growing maybe 8 or 10. And that's monitored by ultrasound. And then we do a small uh, procedure where we put a needle into each of the follicles that have grown in the ovary and suck the eggs out, and we have those in the lab. Uh, Then the gentleman produces a sperm sample, fertilise the eggs in the lab, and then, hey presto, with any luck, 48 hours later we have some embryos, and we put one or sometimes two of those back into the female. And uh, is there any effect on the health of the babies conceived this way with IVF, or is it from that point onwards, is it just the same as a natural pregnancy? More or less. Um, there is a particular type of fertilisation called ICSI, I-C-S-I, or intracytoplasmic sperm injection, where there is a, a male factor problem. And uh, we take a single sperm and inject that directly into the egg, therefore, therefore, therefore bypassing all the natural selection procedures you might imagine that would happen. Um, and for years we did worry that the ICSI children would come out uh, somehow abnormal. This is very reassuring, though there is a, a small uh, increase in, in abnormalities in those children. What success rate do you have with IVF these days? It's presumably been going on for quite a while. How likely is it that this is, that this is going to help someone? Um, I'm afraid it's very much an age-related question. So if you happen to have a simple problem, like your tubes are blocked and you're aged 28, you have a very good chance of a conception per cycle, more than 60%. Uh, Once you get over 35, that's dropping significantly. Um, And over 40, only perhaps 10% of people will get pregnant. And over 45, it doesn't work, unfortunately. So it really is a case of time on that one. Well, thank you very much, Julian, for getting us into the, the basics of what's going on in infertility and the use of IVF. That was Julian Norman Taylor. He's a consultant gynaecologist at the Chelsea and Westminster Hospital in London. Now, some of the things that Julian was talking about uh, are some of the options that are available to people who can't conceive, IVF, of course, being foremost among them. Um, But whilst this technique has helped many, many people, it still has a lot of limitations. And it was one of the topics that was actually raised at the Fertility Show, which took place in London for the first time ever, actually, this week. And Mira Senthalingam went along to meet Alison Murdoch, who is the Professor of Reproductive Medicine at Newcastle Fertility Centre, where she's been working on ways to actually improve the chances of IVF actually working. You have to start really from where IVF began. And the first IVF treatment was over 30 years ago now. And although it has improved, it's not made it a treatment that is going to be guaranteeing that every single woman who comes along is going to achieve a pregnancy. We're now expecting about a quarter of people have one go at IVF to become pregnant. If women come along when they're a lot older, when the eggs are no longer of good quality, I'm afraid there's very little that we can do to help. But there's a lot that we can do, I think, to try and improve the techniques for IVF that we have at the present time. So what are some of the limitations with regard to the IVF treatment itself, so when it comes to the creation of embryos or the health of embryos? I think there's a lot that we can do to try and improve the way that embryos are actually grown within the laboratory. The standard techniques in the laboratory really haven't changed over the past 30 years. They involve handling embryos on a small dish and looking under a microscope and then walking across the room with them, putting them back into the incubator. Now, obviously, potentially, the embryo is going to be harmed by being cooled as you walk across the room. Traditionally, people have said it's impossible to do it any other way, but the embryologists led by Mary Herbert in in Newcastle have actually worked very hard at this and found that it is possible to provide an isolator system. That means that 
Basically, when the sperm and egg go into an enclosed cabinet at the beginning of the IVF procedure, all the manipulations that are done, the checking the embryos, the checking the fertilization, the ICSI procedures, are all done within an enclosed system so that the embryo that comes out two days later has never been in contact with the air at all. It means that we can control its environment totally. So how does this new technology work exactly? So what are the various stages of it and what are the conditions that you're controlling during this? The core part of conventional technology is an incubator where the embryos grow for most of the time and a workstation where we do the manipulation, the insemination and checking the embryos. Conventional technology as these two are separated. In the new isolated technology, they are actually directly joined to each other. So you can move from the working area directly to the incubator and directly back into the working area again. That means that the air in which the embryo is growing is constant. It never changes. It doesn't matter what's happening in the outside air, it will stay exactly the same. So we can control the temperature. We can control the gas concentration that's in the medium. We can make sure it's absolutely clean at all times. Theoretically, that might make better embryos. And the results that we've had, because we've been working with this technology now for over 18 months, does seem to suggest that we're likely to get better embryos because we're getting more pregnancies. So what is the temperature then that you operate at and what are these gases that you're controlling and how are these benefiting the growth of the embryo? A normal body temperature would be 36, 37 degrees. Um, We did some experiments in the conventional system where you put a little microprobe to measure the temperature within the the dish whilst it's sitting under the microscope. Under those circumstances, it's on a heated block and there's heated air, but there's a cooling effect. And within two or three minutes, the fluid that those embryos are lying in will cool down to maybe 32 degrees. That's very cold from body temperature. That's why embryologists have to work really quickly when they're looking at embryos. They want them out for as little time as possible and get them back. That doesn't give them time to to spend the time looking carefully at the embryos, to grade them more accurately. So by, by controlling the temperature at all time, they can take as long as they want to make sure that they've got, they're doing exactly absolutely the right thing for the embryo. And now you mentioned also that the gas concentrators are controlled. So which gases are controlled and what effect can this have on embryo growth? And um, All gases are controlled. Um, we need to make sure, first of all, that the carbon dioxide is, level is, is accurate. This is because the acidity in fluid... Uh, is controlled by carbon dioxide. And if we have the wrong concentration of carbon dioxide, the fluid that the the embryos are in can become too acid and can harm them. We also need to make sure the oxygen tension is right. In the body, the oxygen concentration might be about 5%, whereas in the air, it's 20%. We really don't know what harm that change would have um, in, in culturing embryos. But within an enclosed system, we can, of course, control that precisely and make absolutely sure that we have as near body body, uh, concentrations as possible. There must be, I mean, there's obviously a slight exposure to the natural environment between having made these um, embryos and then implanting it into the women, but I assume that's a very small gap then and that will be accounted for too. Yes, obviously when the embryo comes out of the incubators for the finally to go back into the patient, it's got to happen that way. What we do though is we put the embryos into a very fine catheter the embryologist is sitting next to the patient. It's handed to the doctor to put, or the nurse to put back into the patient, and it literally will take a few seconds as it crosses the room. So I don't think that that's an, that's an area we could do much about. And so how much is this technology in use at the moment? So, and is it likely to expand and be used in more clinics? Well, it still is very new, and ours is the first system, but there are other units now in Europe as well who, who, who are buying it, investing in it. I think it is the way it will go because intuitively it has to be better. If you had an embryo, uh, if it were your embryo, would you want it to be subject to the external environment or would you want it to be in in an enclosed system where we can control it completely? And any embryologist will say it has to be theoretically better. It's still early days to see the the impact um, on the quality of the embryos and pregnancy rates. We'll publish the data when we've got it completed. Alice Murdoch, who's from the Newcastle Fertility Centre, and she was talking to Mira Senthalingam at the Fertility Show in London earlier this week. This is The Naked Scientist with Chris and Helen and we're talking the science of fertility and reproduction. And now it's time for Kitchen Science. This week Ben Valslow and Dave Ansell are going to work on an egg. For Kitchen Science this week we're going to look at one of the wonders of reproduction and that is the egg. And to be precise we're going to look at something that almost all of you will have in your home right now and that's a chicken egg. Dave, what are we doing with our eggs today? Well, I thought it'd be interesting to have a look at an egg without its shell. The plan is to basically take an egg and put it in vinegar. So we're, we're kind of pickling the egg? 
not really pickling it. The eggshell is made out of a substance called calcium carbonate, which is the same stuff that limestone is made out of. And if you put that in an acid, it will dissolve. Well, it'll be very interesting to see what an egg looks like without its shell. So we take our egg, a nice free-range egg, we're going to put this into a cup or a jar, and now we're going to pour on white vinegar. How long are we going to have to wait, Dave? It doesn't look all that exciting. It's about 24 hours. Although if you have a look at it at the moment carefully... It is fizzing away, actually, isn't it? Yes, what's going on here is that the calcium carbonate in the eggshell is reacting with the acid. Inside an acid, you've got some hydrogen ions, H pluses. They're floating around. They're actually stuck to water molecules. They're H3O pluses. These H pluses then react with the carbonate, CO3 minus, to form H2CO3, um, which can then decompose to form water, H2O, and carbon dioxide, CO2. Carbon dioxide then bubbles away in producing fizz, just like in a fizzy drink. Okay, now you said this is going to take 24 hours. It's already fizzing away nicely, but what are we actually going to see when it's all done? Because I knew you'd be impatient, Ben. I thought I'd make one earlier. So over here in a jam jar, which I've just cycled from home with, I have an egg which has been sitting there since yesterday morning. So let's see. So in this jar, it's a very translucent-looking egg. You can clearly see the orange of the yolk in the middle of it. But what's all this pink stuff floating about in there, Dave. It looks like it's got really dirty. Well, it was quite a brown egg to start with, and actually it's the very outer layer of the eggshell which is coloured. It went through a stage where it had a white shell, um, and that falls off, and I think it's probably some kind of protein with some reddy colour in it which colours the egg, and that's just sort of floating around in little lumps. And what can we actually see on the surface of the egg now? Obviously that's not shell anymore, that must be some kind of membrane. Yeah, the shell isn't really waterproof and it isn't gasproof. So there's a membrane under the shell which controls the movement of gases in and out and keeps all the liquids inside the egg. So the shell is just there for strength and that membrane really is to control its relationship with the outside world. Yeah, that's right. In fact, we can take it out and have a look. It looks very wobbly and jelly-like. Yep, that's because it's a raw egg. (laughs) But actually, you can handle it. I mean, if I threw it on the floor, it would probably break, but it's reasonably strong, yes. Do you want to feel it? Oh, wow. It's a lot stronger than you'd expect for an egg with no shell. It's quite rubbery. It feels like a bouncy ball, but it feels very full and very firm. Part of the reason why it's feeling so firm is because it's been sitting in water for a long time, or in vinegar, which has got lots of water in it. And osmosis means that the water will probably be transferred into the egg rather than out of it, so it tends to swell up. What are you going to do now? It's quite hard to see what's actually in there. Well, I thought it'd be quite a nice chance to actually try dissecting an egg and looking at what's inside there without the eggshell having mashed it all up when you break it. Are we expecting to see anything that we wouldn't normally see? I don't really know. I just thought I wanted to have a look. (laughs) Well, I suppose it's not every day that you get to dissect a raw egg. So Dave's grabbed a razor blade. Now we're going to very carefully cut this open. So, Oh! Dave has now squirted egg all over himself... But he's very carefully picking out the membrane. Now, that looks exactly the same as an egg that's been cracked into a frying pan, Dave, except for that membrane. What's so interesting about that? Well, it's something which you can see on a normal egg, but you very rarely see it as a whole thing. And just generally looking at an egg carefully isn't something you do every day. You just eat the things. Um, You can see the membrane here. It's actually quite a strong membrane. Okay, and working our way in from the membrane, we essentially now have a plate full of some very liquid, what would be egg white if we were to cook it, and then some thicker, sort of yellower, more jelly-like egg white. Is that what we expect, or is that a result of pickling it? There's a thin albumen and the thick albumen. Um, The thin albumen's on the outside and is quite liquid, and the thicker one is much more jelly-like and acts as protection for the growing chick. It acts a bit like a shock absorber. Um, and if you look inside the thick albumen on either end of the yolk, if you get the yolk the right way round, you can see a little structure on the end. Yes, there's a sort of stringy, milky white colour. That's called the chalaza, and it's actually is used to hold the yolk in one place so it doesn't float around inside the egg and end up bashing into things or end up too near to the side and not get the protection of the albumen. It basically just holds the yolk in the middle of the albumen. And otherwise, the yolk is just the usual 
orange blob that we normally see with a little bit of variation. There's a white patch on the top there. What's that? I think this is called the germinal disc. This is where the ovum um, starts off. And if it gets fertilised, that's where the chick starts to grow, eating all the fuel which is stored in the yolk. The yolk's got lots of lovely fat and protein in it, which we like eating. It's actually designed there to feed a chick as it grows. Um, and eventually the chick ends up using some of the water in the album and fills up the whole egg and then breaks out and escapes. Now, who would have thought that it would be so interesting to have a good look at something that we eat very often for our breakfast? That's all for Kitchen Science this week, and we'll be back very soon. So next time you have an egg for your breakfast, and I hope it's an organic, free-range egg, have a closer look and see what you can find. We'll put pictures up and video on the website at thenakedscientist.com forward slash kitchen science. Laying the facts bare. I say. The Naked Scientists. It's The Naked Scientist with Dr Chris and Dr Helen. We're talking about the science of reproduction and fertility this week. Uh, I've got some lovely questions coming in, including for our guests from the guys from Cambridge Temperature Concepts. Uh, Oriane, uh, Eth Mount Fitchett says, it was said that women's temperature can rise between 0.3 and 1.5 degrees. Crocodiles use temperature to regulate whether their eggs turn into males or females. So is it known whether women's temperature, altering in the same way, can, can affect the outcome of her babies in the same way? No, I've never heard of that for women, unfortunately. But <laughs> sorry, it'd be quite good if it would, though. There'd be it all these would. people putting their women in the in the freezer or uh, in the in the oven according to what they wanted, wouldn't they? Don't know if that'd be good. <laughs> now, Seamus, good job you piped up because Barbara, who's in Friday Bridge, says she was having problems conceiving in 1980. Before she got up every morning, she had to take a temperature. She says very simple method. Um, how does that really differ from this new technology, which seems a bit complicated? Well, that's exactly the same technique that my parents used uh, to have me. It was uh, very common in the uh, 70s and 80s. Um, but unfortunately, um, it's not highly precise for everyone. The Dual Fertility Monitor, which we've created, uh, ensures primarily that you have no missed measurements, which can cause the data to be uh, uninterpretable, um, and that it's much more reliable because it measures up to 20,000 temperatures per night and your movement to get the sleeping temperature because when you wake up, body changes in temperature very rapidly. So if you change the time that you measure it, you can introduce a lot of noise on that data. That means if you're one of these women with a 0.3 degree temperature change on your cycle, you can completely lose that. If you're lucky enough to have a 1.5 degree change in your cycle, you're probably going to be okay. So it comes down to the accuracy of measurement and the noise and also the statistical analysis of that data rather than waiting for three days after ovulation to determine that you have seen the rise using the old 3 over 6 rule. We can spot that within a day, which means the egg is still alive and you still have time to conceive that cycle. Thank you very much. That's Seamus this year. And uh, this is The Naked Scientist. We heard from Science Copperfield, who's listening to us in Second Life. Don't forget, uh, every week, 11 o'clock at uh, Second Life, we beam this in on a Sunday so you can listen to the programme there. He says, live sperm under a microscope swim around in all directions, um, and they're going really fast. In fact, I heard from Lisa Rankin, who wanted to know exactly how fast. Um, he says, how do they actually track down an egg? They're doing the equivalent of flying from Earth to the moon, and they're blind, and they've got no rocket to do it in. So how do they know where to go? Well, let's answer all those questions. Lisa Rankin's question first, how fast does sperm swim? Well, the answer is about five millimetres per minute, and uh, it's in fact five body lengths of the sperm per second. So if you scaled them up, if they were the size of a salmon, that would be the equivalent of the salmon swimming along at 500 miles an hour, um, or a whale doing 15,000 miles an hour. So sperm are pretty snappy. They get to the egg pretty fast, certainly within a day or so. How do they find it? They recognise it by two means. One is a thermal gradient. They follow temperature. So they know that the body gets warmer the further in they go. So they follow the thermal gradient. And the second is that the egg oozes out various attractive molecules, which in the same way that various inflammatory things attract the immune system in, this pulls the uh, sperm towards the egg because they follow their noses, quite literally. Helen. So we've had a question on Twitter from Liza Brooks, and she says, my gran is an identical twin, my mum is also a twin, but I'm not. Is the chance increased that I will have twins, or is that actually a myth? What do you think about that, Oriane? Well, there's not much information about identical twin being something you can pass on generation from generation. However, if your mum is an, has an identical, uh, a non-identical twin, then your chances of having twins are quite increased as well. Why is that? Uh, why is that? Um, the first one is identical twin results from uh, one sperm meeting the egg and then the egg dividing into two embryos instead of just one, as it would occur normally. 
In the case of not identical twin, you have either two eggs that are produced and each meet a separate sperm. And that is uh, something that can be passed on generation to generation. We've also heard from Natasha, who wants to know, um, what happens to all the sperm that isn't ejaculated? Um, where does it go, and is it still healthy? Yes, it's a very good question, because the, obviously the testes make sperm. They make sperm at about 5,000 sperm a second at peak, so they can make sperm at prodigiously fast rates. Um, and they put that sperm into what are called the seminal vesicles, which are structures up inside the body. So sperm are made at a lower temperature, the testicles, which that's why they're outside the body, because the temperature is about one degree lower. But then the sperm are best stored and kept viable inside the body at body temperature, 37 degrees. So they go into these seminal vesicles, they're nourished there, they have various components of semen, which has got fructose and other sugars and things in it to keep the sperm healthy. They can survive for quite a long period of time inside the body, but eventually they will fatigue and they will age. And of course all the things that you take into your body, cigarette smoke, other toxins and things, will damage the sperm potentially, so they have a sort of recycle time. So sperm that have reached their sell-by date get scavenged back and broken down in the same way that, say, blood cells get broken down. And basically, any of the nutrients and goodies in the sperm just get recycled back inside the body and new sperm are produced uh, to make up for the shortfall. So it's a kind of continual sort of replacement, really. Exactly. Those those that don't leave the body eventually break down and are scavenged back. Um, We've also had a question from Yasser, who wants to know if pregnancy is detectable by smell. Do pregnant women smell different, basically? Any thoughts on that? I think that you could probably make a case. I don't know what you think, Oriane, but I think you can probably make a case that, that you could detect pregnancy on the basis of smell because, say, mosquitoes make a beeline for women who are pregnant. Um, that could be for a number of reasons. One of them is that women who are pregnant have a higher metabolic rate, so they breathe more. They also have a higher temperature due yep. to the high progesterone during pregnancy. So it could be either of those things, yeah. but um, if they're having a higher temperature, they're probably exuding more volatile chemicals, so mm-hmm. they, they probably will have a slightly different smell signature. The mosquitoes can definitely home in on them. So I think probably you could train a dog in the same way that dogs can be trained to discriminate urine from people who have renal and bladder cancers on the basis of the volatile chemicals that the cancer puts into the urine. Dogs can pick that up. I reckon you probably could train a dog something with a very sensitive nose, on, say, a woman's urine or on a woman's sweat in order to tell whether she's pregnant on the basis of a slight shift in in the metabolism of that pregnant person. An interesting form of sniffer dogs, definitely. (laughs) And we've had uh, another Twitter question from Singing Fish. He wants to know, what are the risks associated with tubal ligation and vasectomy? Okay, so these are methods of sterilisation. Tubal ligation means that you go inside the peritoneal cavity in the woman in the pelvis you identify the fallopian tube on each side you can see that quite easily because they're about five millimeters across and you clamp them you put a very large paper clip which is squashed onto the tube and it crunches the tube closed and the idea of that is that then what it does is basically squash the tube so that the egg released by the ovary cannot make its way down the tube to get into the uterus and at the same time sperm cannot get along the tube to meet the egg and fertilise it otherwise you might get the risk of what's called an ectopic pregnancy the the actual egg starting to be fertilised and grow outside the uterus. Um, The risks of tubal ligation are that it doesn't work. Um, It's a small risk but there's nonetheless a risk that uh, you could fail to completely close off the pathway. Another possibility with any invasive procedure is of course that you can cause pain, you could cause bleeding, you could get localised infection. With vasectomy, very safe procedure, pretty similar though, you basically are cutting, folding back on themselves and tying off the vas deferens, which are the tubes that carry sperm from the testicle up inside the body. The idea being that then you interrupt the route that the sperm will follow out of the testes. The risks are pretty similar to having tubal ligation and the fact is that occasionally um, there is incomplete severance. There may be a route by which sperm can still make it through. Also, you don't stop being fertile the minute you have it done. There's a flush out or a wash out period afterwards and so if someone just has a vasectomy and then assumes they're uh, now no longer capable of fathering children, they could be in for a shock. And presumably the same question um, that we had before comes up here that uh, the sperm that are in, a, in the testicles, that if it's not got any way of getting out, it just stays there, but also is broken down over time if it's not actually released. Yeah, it, you don't end up with your testicles expanding progressively over time. I did time. always wonder about uh, that, actually. <laughs> uh, with all this sort of sperm that's sort of left stuck there. Uh, unfortunately, no, it doesn't happen. Thankfully, I suppose it doesn't happen. Uh, in fact, it's, it's just basically broken down and, and those cellular uh, constituents get recycled.
Well, now it's time for Question of the Week. And with us in the studio once again is Diana O'Carroll. Hi, Diana. Hello. Yes, this week we've got a fantastic question about sperm. Hi, it's Harfin Tupor from Milford Haven here. My question this week is, how many children does the average sperm donor create? Well, there isn't an office for sperm donor statistics, since there's so much that must remain confidential. But there are other ways of finding out how many offspring a donor will produce. My name is Wendy Kramer, and I am the co-founder and the director of the Donor Sibling Registry. Well, the answer to that's a little bit tricky because nobody keeps track. What we do know is that the guidelines here in the U.S. are supposed to be that only 25 pregnancies per 800,000 of a population area should be allowed for each donor. So that would mean that what they would like to do is limit each donor to 380 children. But the bottom line is the sperm banking industry doesn't keep track. They don't have accurate record keeping, so they really don't know how many kids are born from any one donor. For instance, we have one donor on our site that says they donated two times a week for two and a half years, and this is pretty common. Each one of his donations turned into approximately 10 to 15 vials. So he produced over 3,000 vials during that time. So just for that one donor, 3,000 vials were sent out, but we don't know how many children were born from those 3,000. You could say maybe up to 3,000, but we don't know. What we do know is that on our website, we have very large groups of half-siblings or people born from the same donor. Many in the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, with the largest group that we know being just over 125. Yes, you heard right. One sperm donor has at least 125 offspring, and other groups of donor siblings are between 35 and 50 in number. Sperm samples in the UK and the US can be chosen according to certain characteristics, such as family history, physical appearance and blood group, so it is kind of inevitable that some samples will be more popular than others. On the forum, RD said he thinks that there's a limit on sperm donors, meaning that they can father children only in 10 families, but that doesn't necessarily limit the number of children they can help to produce. And Shib said he heard of a story about a gentleman in the Netherlands who produced 46 kids and had a big party for them all in his house. (laughs) Well, it's a fascinating phenomenon, actually, because Genghis Khan, the 13th century Mongolian emperor, was similarly prolific. And there was a study in 2003 that found up to 8% of the males now living in what was the Mongolian Empire have Khan's Y chromosome. So the researchers think that Genghis Khan has up to 16 million descendants living today. So modern day big donor families may have a genetic impact even 700 years down the line. But now I'm going to throw in a bit of business jargon here and get you all to do some blue skies thinking. This is Jade Forrester from Leamington Spa. I've always wondered about the old saying, red sky at night, shepherd's delight, red sky in the morning, shepherd's warning. Why do we get red sky and how does this say and predict the weather for the next day? Thanks, you guys. Do red skies tell us about the weather to come? We need your help for our answers. So email us with the address chris at thenakedscientist.com or write your answers on the forum. And that's at thenakedscientist.com forward slash forum. Thank you very much, Diana. Um, You can... Hear more from Question of the Week from our website, nakedscientist.com forward slash QOTW. You can also get it as a podcast in its own right if you want to follow Just Question of the Week. That's on iTunes or again from our website. We also heard from uh, Mark in Bletchley who says he's tried the item that you mentioned in the news, Helen, about eating your food more slowly. He said he did force himself to eat more slowly and ended up leaving some food. He doesn't actually say how much food he was trying to eat, though. Uh, So it could actually be a self-fulfilling prophecy. I don't know. Well, keep trying anyway. Right. Well, that's all we have got time for this week we have to leave it there it just remains for me to say a very big thank you to our guests this week julia norman taylor alison murdoch and kathleen vermker and also to orian shozio and seamus hashir from cambridge temperature concepts and incidentally if you're interested in finding out a bit more about their temperature measuring device we've actually put a link to the product which is called duo fertility on our website at nakedscientist.com forward slash podcast so locate the show for this week and in the interview there'll be a transcript there and a link to their website. Next week, we're actually blasting off into outer space and we'll be finding out how planets form. So send in your space science-related questions. It's chris at thenakedscientist.com or you can Twitter at us, of course, at 
Naked Scientist is the address. Thank you to our wonderful production team this week, Dave Ansell, Ben Vals, Lamira Senthalingam and Diana O'Carroll. Have a great week and we'll see you next time. Goodbye. The Naked Scientist podcast comes to you from Cambridge University and is supported by the Wellcome Trust, the EPSRC and UK Fast. For more information, look us up online at nakedscientist.com.